let's uh, maybe start at the start. How did you get started playing guitar, or did you start out on that even? Uh, I did. Um, I was like, and I'm not exactly sure, but I think I was around 13, and my sister was taking guitar lessons from a guy named uh, Big Al Thompson at Bandwagon Music in Bellevue, and he was an old jazz cat, about six foot four, just a master of uh, jazz recording. You know, one of the guys would play at the lounge at the Sandpoint Gable Air Station and stuff like that, you know. The old jazz guy. And taught out of Mel Bay books, and my sister got bored, and my parents wanted to know if I wanted her slot. And I wanted to learn banjo, but he didn't teach banjo, so I decided to go ahead and take guitar. And started in Mel Bay books learning how to read, and... And then he started teaching me jazz chords, chord solos, like Girl from Ipanema or whatever that is, Fly Me to the Moon and all these old jazz standards. And that's how I started. I did that for about two years. And uh, then uh, and while I was still taking lessons from him, I joined stage band at uh, Interlake High School and became a select guitarist, and he helped me with charts. So I was playing really cool chord voices and stuff that the typical kid might not figure out. Mm. You know, uh, like I was playing jazz chords the way real guys play jazz chords back at the big band era, because that's, you know, that was his influence. Sure, sure. And uh, so, uh, but I was starting to get bored because he didn't teach rock. He didn't know anything about rock. And uh, so I started copying things off of records and we took music theory at school. Uh, back then I was able to take jazz workshop, music theory, all this stuff at school, which of course, unfortunately, kids can't do anymore. Yeah. So I got a pretty good background in how the, the math of music, how it all was put together. Hmm. And then I just started, I worked really hard with my ear and got to where uh, my goal of being a perfectionist was if I learned a solo, I wanted to learn it exact. And if we were going to, if I was going to play it with anyone, I wanted to play it like the real guy. I didn't want to play it like myself because I figured I'd write music to show people what I could do. But I think people want to hear Ricky Blackmore want to hear a Deep Purple song, not Joe Schmo, Joe Schmo <laughs> trying to be Ricky Blackmore, you know, uh, his version of Ricky Blackmore, you know. So there, that's a long answer, but that's how I got started. Um, what were, who were some of your influences? Obviously you had some jazz background there. Um, what about on the rock and roll side? Sounds like you kind of had a lot of interest there growing up and as many did in the, I mean, I'm assuming it was the, probably the early sixties or so there. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, uh, it was late sixties and early seventies. Okay. Um, and, uh, but the, the first time I heard a long guitar solo, was a friend of mine, knowing I was starting to take guitar, wanted to show me what real guitar was, and he showed me Help Me Big by Alvin Lee on mm. 10 years after recorded live. And I was forever smitten, and he was one of my, he was my first guitar hero. And we got to uh, open for, Rail got to open for him at the Paramount in Seattle, and I went and saw him by myself in Portland once. And, um, I got to talk to him for almost an hour once, and that was really cool. But, uh, you know, I only copped a few things from him, but it was the spirit of who he was, and I used to listen to... I had three biblical proportion albums for me, and they were all live double albums. And it was 10 years after recorded live, made in Japan by Deep Purple, and, well, it actually, I think it was a triple album, Yes Songs. And they were all technical guys. Yeah. And I was really yeah. into, in the early stages, the people that were essentially by considered by many still to this day to be masters of their instruments, you know, pretty technical players. And I, did, I never really got into Clapton, even though I liked a lot of his stuff, especially Cream, I never really copied his stuff. And in the early days, I didn't cop a bunch of Hendrix. I became a Hendrix fan much more later. Hmm. Uh, so, and then, and then, of course, then I, I found uh, Jimmy Page and still consider him to be just the to have written some of the most beautiful guitar work ever done as far as orchestration and everything. And uh, and then, the, then it came on to the, the, the European hard rockers like Michael Schenker, and I never know how to say his name, Yerli Roth or Yerlik Roth or Roach or whatever the, you know, <laughs> the Scorpions. Holy and, uh, uh, you know, and, and by the time people like Eddie Van Halen rolled around, even though we toured with him, he was one year older than I, so... 
well, being impressed with him, he wasn't an influence because I was already grown up and already had my influences, you know, so he was more of a yeah. temporary as far as, um, so at that stage forward, there weren't a lot of people that caught that much of my attention because they were like also rants, even if they thought they were technically better or very interesting players, they didn't tug at the emotional strings like people when you're coming up, you know. Yeah, all three great guitarists, definitely with Steve Howe and Richie Blackmore and Alvin Lee, certainly. Yeah, just uh, wonderful, wonderful players. Uh, I, I got a chance to meet two of the three. Uh, Richie Blackmore, I don't want, I don't would like to say too much negative about him, <laughs> but he was not particularly friendly men in Portland. And uh, I've heard similar stories about Steve Howe from Roger Fisher and Hart, but I didn't have about him either. Um, and uh, my, my, my target has changed a lot. I like orchestral uh, composing guitars a lot more now, like uh, mm. what's his name from Fleetwood Mac and people like that that write unforgettable thematic elements, you know. Yeah. I find that more interesting now than trying to show everybody a bunch of calisthenics, you know. Yeah, everybody kind of pushed that to the limit anyway, I think, especially yeah, in the 80s. Yeah, a lot of us are out on it now, you know, and they still like to play technical things. Uh-huh. And and uh, and I'm uh, picking fingers in place and being the younger version of, my, of myself couldn't even hope to play. Mm. But I don't like to hang my hat on the technique so much anymore, you know. Yeah, I understand. Um, so, Rail formed back around, sounds around 1970. Um, and... Uh, you joined a couple years after that or something around that? or I, I, I joined in 73, because remember, I, I, I joined the, the jazz band at school, and my main intent was to meet other musicians so I could get in the band, because mm. I'd really been working on my, my playing. And by then, I had already gotten well into, like I'd memorized entire songs off of Made in Japan and stuff. And so I met Andy Baldwin because he wanted to learn how to read, and he joined jazz band, and so we were the two guitarists. So I taught him some of the charts, and he showed me some of the songs he was playing with the other guys. And it's a funny story because they had a gig for a New Year's Eve at a Mormon church dance, of all things. <laughs> and they had a contract for four people, and it was the three of them, and they had a chick lead singer, and she couldn't do the show. So the contract said essentially four warm bodies. So he asked me if I'd be interested in doing the gig with them, just the one gig. And so they all met me and, and thought, yeah, he's all right, okay. And so I did one gig with them and then they decided that they liked what I was doing. And so the girl came back and she was in the band and I gave her rights to practice and did one gig with her. And then they, not me, because I had no voting rights yet, I was still a newbie, they let her go. And so then it was the four of us. And that's not happening. It's kind of funny. You know, so I replaced the Chickly Singers. Kind of, yeah, let's get rid of the Chickly Singer and get another new guitarist. I don't know, whatever. It's kind of funny. So that's, Terry kind of started out more just playing bass and then eventually kind of moved on to doing the, the lead vocal. Well, he had done lead all along, but he often had, they had a total of, um, and I was there for two of them, but a total of four different lead, other lead singers. Ooh. And so the idea was, that, and I liked, I must say, I always thought it was really cool when we had two lead singers, because they did some great double harmonies together, yeah. and then you'd have the singer, like a plant or, a, a, you know, a Aerosmith type situation where you had a singer on their own, and then the bass player would come up and just blow everyone away by being a really good singer, and you had some contrast, which makes it interesting out front. So I thought it worked. It was kind of a cool approach, but then later, uh, you know, we, we kept returning to the original four, and then just, you know, we just stayed that way. Kind of solidified the lineup at that point, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it, it, when I got in, a little while after, Chris Kincaid came in as the lead vocalist, and he's part of how we projected ourselves to do the the Paramount gigs and stuff, because we became very popular with him as a singer, because he was pretty uh, uh, animated and engaging with the crowd and everything, and helped us to get a larger following. And then he left to, to uh, take up acting and, and went to California. He's been in several movies since. In fact, I'm doing music projects with him. Uh, right as we speak, but he left, 
and we decided to just go back to the four, and then uh, it it never changed from being four players from then on. Yeah. And that was uh, like seventy eight or something, seventy seven, but pretty early. So it's been the same four ever since, with a few exceptions. I left for to go to college for a while, for like two and a half years or something, and they had the three other guitar players during that period. And then Kelly, for a while, when he moved down to Oregon, wasn't available. We used a different drummer for a few gigs. And then we decided to get back to the four of us again. So I'd say 90% of the shows the band has done, uh, maybe 95% of the shows that we've done, and all the right recording was the four of us. I see. So do you guys start out... Um doing cover songs pretty much or did you have original stuff you were doing yeah no originals at the very beginning i mean we we kind of toyed with it those guys even toyed with it before i got in but didn't have anything when i got in and then we ended up having a total of three originals for like three or four years Mm. and we are and we barely played them on stage and and because we had so much attention doing the covers it's sort of like we weren't encouraged to do our own it was a different era yeah. You could sell out the Paramount playing cover songs. <laughs> Same. Same when you think about it. Yeah. And we did. And I, I, I was there. I was 19 years old, and the Paramount was completely sold out, 3,000 people. Wow. And we were the headliner with two other local bands opening, uh, Hometown Heroes, playing all cover songs. You know, Stranglehold and Freebird, and, you know, and the crowd going nuts. I mean, going nuts. If I had a video of that today, people would be shocked. That, wow, look at the crowd reactions. Look at that. I mean, they were, they were nuts. Because to them, it's like local guys making it. Yeah. You know? It's just fun. Yeah. You know? Uh, but it was all covers. You know? And it took us going back into the bars as that era started the end, the end of the whole live music thing with, with disco and everything coming in. And people just not, the dance halls collapsing. And there was no live market, and we were we started playing bars, and pretty soon that's all there was to play. So the colleges, the high schools, the dance halls, uh, the theaters, all that went away for bands that weren't like the theaters were then only available really to national acts, so much more, you know. Yeah. And so you had to go in the bars and go to work. So as we went in the bars, we started really working on our own material. So did Hart kind of um, open that up a little bit? I mean, they had to move to Vancouver pretty much to get signed, I think, originally. But did uh, that was early tours for you guys was open it up for them, uh, I heard, as well, and, and a few yeah, other we, things. We, we did a few shows with them, and we got to know Michael, and we were working already working well into writing our own music when uh, Michael's saw us opening up for Hart at the P&E in, the, uh, in uh, Vancouver, about 17,000 people, and was impressed with the band, and we started talking with them, and then we ended up, uh, we started working on an album together out at Roger's house with Michael producing. And so, yeah, they, I mean, and that was probably 79. So this whole thing happened pretty quick. Yeah. Where When I got out of 73, nobody knew who we were. We hadn't even played a high school yet. And, uh, and then we ended up playing the, the Paramounts in like 76 or 7, two or three, I think it was, we, I played the Paramount eight times, but I think we played it three or four times where we headlined, and then all the others were opening for like Joan Jett and Missing Persons and Angel City and and others, and uh, Alba Lee. But all this stuff happened in a fairly quick amount of time when you think about it. Uh, by the by. 1980, we were doing a Van Halen tour and halfway done with our album with Michael, and that was only six years after I got the band. Wow. And by then, we had won Best Local Band and uh, opened up our heart at the Coliseum. Uh, with a, we got presented with a KTOK hand for Best Local Band. We just got lots of accolades and lots of attention, and it was, a, it was like an amusement park ride. And I was sort of aware then and much more aware now that only part of that is ever the doing of the people that are actually acting in it. Some of it's just a ride that you fall into because there's so many players all around that are uh, as good or better at any at anything 
compared to anyone in any band, you know. Mm, so it yeah. can't just be you you talented your way into a high level attention. There's got to be some smoke and mirrors and <laughs> voodoo and magic and God and fate or whatever the heck it is that makes some groups get more attention than others, you know. Yeah. It's just yeah, we captured a nerve. People like this. And uh, so it was It was a real, uh, it was like an amusement park ride. I mean, it was the type of thing we'd go into a party and people would stop and look at us because they knew who we were. <laughs> Now we go to a party and it's like, Yeah, well, I'm just looking, all right, well, where's the beer? <laughs> <laughs> And that could be right after playing. <laughs> yeah. I'm joking, but, you know, it's a very different situation uh, now than it was then. I think it's always that, you know, capturing the lightning in a bottle sort of thing that people say that you, right place in the right time, the luck of everything kind of falling into place, you know, you have the talent, you have the drive, and sticking with it and people start to notice kind of thing sounds like that's what happened for you guys as well it did and there's something and i can't explain it but there's something that people have when when it sorry for that of being bulletproof that helps me to go even further hmm. because you're uh just a second sure <laughs> I put you. I, I started my car and I wanted to put you back off of uh, hands free. So uh, there's this um, feeling that you're, you're bulletproof and can do no wrong. Um, that helps to. Uh, I mean, it's just a celebration then, and you know it, and you just know that you're on a ride, and there's zero doubt. Uh, the doubt. I mean, there's the typical. Well, many school doubts that go along like a challenging part where you're not sure if you have it worked out totally yet or maybe there's an issue with equipment or something. It could happen to any player. But as far as your overall feeling about yourself and the group, doubt is not part of the equation. It's not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you, if you have a long career, you go in and out of periods where you have doubt and uh, it's just a natural turn of events and just getting older and going to the normal changes in life, uh, it becomes a different type of ride. Yeah. So it's like the band had several careers. We had the early career that was local, where we were playing dance halls and high schools in the Paramount, and we were just, we really were on, uh, we were uh, using Unicam Booking Agency, which was the king of the one-nighters in the Northwest. And we were the number one band, highest paid band, and we were the biggest draw mm -hmm. of in the area that wasn't a national band, you know, like not comparing to Hart, who had already started to become national. Yeah. Um, and so we were uh, dominating the, the area from the casual market and not playing the bars hardly at all, you know, just a little bit here and there. And the bars really didn't know who we were as much because it was the younger crowd that had gotten to know us. And then as the younger crowd grew older and the whole thing went away, and way, as I said before, we moved into the bars, we started using different booking agents, and we ended up with another career. And during that career, we started exploring hard rock from now called hard rock, then sort of metal rock, the yeah. UFOs and, and Judas Priest, Black Show, and stuff like that out of Europe. And we were writing our own material, and we ended up having another uh Uh, pinnacle, like we, we played a club called the Foghorn in Portland, uh, and we used to just pack the place, and it was thrilling, and it was fun, and it was a whole different career in a way. It was a different mm. type of music, it was a different dynamic, and we had climbed on top of another hill, and we were perched right up there like one of the top guys, and it felt like, here we go again, you know? And, and then we just started touring, and then we did the MTV thing, and that was yet another one. Yeah. <laughs> So it's almost like we've had, and now, of course, we have a more mature stage of the band where it's very different, where, you know, we're not doing really big stuff, but we're still out and drawing and, and playing and doing festivals and stuff like that. So it's almost like numerous careers in one, you know, hmm. each one of them having some similarities, the common denominator being the same guys and uh, different different stages, and um, I, I find that kind of fascinating, that it, and it probably is not that uncommon for any bands. It's highly unusual, first off, of course, 
to have, I've now been in the band 40 years with, I think, two and a half years, not constant with them. So the same guys started 40 years ago that are playing together today, and I, 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 I don't know hardly any bands that could make that kind of money. CC Top is all original, the three guys. But, uh, you know, either locally, nationally, or internationally, it's extremely rare. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, almost unheard of. I don't know of any bands myself. I can't think of any. The only way I can think of is CC Top, because I, I know it's the same three guys, and they've been together for like 42 or three years. Um, can you think of a band? I can't think of one. <laughs> um, it's only if it's any national, any local bands. I can't think of any. Most of them go through members leaving or losing members, different people coming and going, and eventually maybe they get back together. Or it's it's hard to think of one that could really qualify that it's all the same original members. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any, and I'm sure there may be some out there, but we were thinking of trying to research that so we could lay claim that <laughs> they're probably one of the longest standing bands in the world. Yeah. You know, I think that's probably a safe claim. Certainly one of the longest standing bands in the world. First off, knock on wood, you kind of all stay alive. That's yeah, a, that's a big part. <laughs> kind of an important component to that argument, you know. <laughs> Especially all the drugs and alcohol over the years, and outside influences and stuff that got to people and so forth. But, um, yeah, it's pretty a pretty amazing accomplishment. Um, well, going back a little bit to um, talking about your first album that you did with Michael Fisher, um, that was an independent album that you put out on your own label. And um, so it, it it's it sounds like it did really well at the time. It sold a couple hundred thousand copies and got some radio play for for a song or two off of it. Um, well, and also the song "Hello" was from that record that we did the video that won the MTV Mason tape. So that uh, certainly yeah. speaks well to the album. But it also we think. Well, we have no way of proving it, unfortunately, but we think we sold a lot more than a couple hundred thousand records because we sold a few hundred thousand of the second record, and we had more more widespread distribution of the first because we got distribution through Jeb, J-E-M, records, mm. and they had in-house pressing, and they had a major reputation as uh, as a total rip-off. <laughs> in fact, I, yeah. I went to the New Music Seminar in New York in about 90... I want to say, you know, 89 or something. And somebody had a shirt on that said, yeah, Gem Records ripped me off. <laughs> and I went up to him and I said, what's that all about? And he said, well, I used to work for him. And it's kind of a raining joke. And I go, really? And he goes, I said, we had a record distributed to them. He goes, really, what was it? And I told him the name of the band, and he goes, he said, D-Y-N-3-F or something. He remembered our catalog number. Oh, wow. And I go, well, that's amazing. <laughs> he goes, you guys had records, especially on the MTV thing, and he goes, you guys had records just flying out the door. I go, really? And I said, uh, they paid us for, I forget, only tens of thousands of records. And uh, he said, oh, it was... It just dwarfed that. He goes, uh, and and I. The reason I know that is like we when we were on tour and EMI was supporting us, we could go into Omaha, Nebraska, or something, and go into a store, and the EMI record wouldn't have distribution there, but that record would. Weird. Yeah, I've definitely seen more copies of Arrival and had a few myself over the years. Yeah, <laughs> it's it really did quite well considering, and well, well unfortunately, because we had uh, a uh, you know. They had in-house pressing, and they just weren't honest. Uh, we just don't know. Some distribution deals, yeah. Yeah, we're just never going to know how many records we sold. They screwed a lot of import. Um, they did a lot of importing over to to the U.S. and a lot of bands from overseas and stuff. And they never got any money out of it. <laughs> well, we know that they had a trade deal going with that store in Oregon to Norway, and and other parts of, huh. of Northern Europe, and that we were really popular there, and we never got over there, and we don't know how many we sold over there, except that this one store was selling way more than its normal share of records. Uh -huh. So we were asking, what's that all about? And they said, oh, we're sending a bunch to Europe. You know, wow. Who knows? Yeah. You never know. One thing we know is we could see where we were selling and where we weren't. We, uh, where we sold was 
because even with the MDB thing, cable wasn't anything like it is today. So the permutation of MDB wasn't near as high. And we had standard radio support. Like in Denver, we had massive radio airplay, and we were on MTV, and we sold out the rainbow with 2,000 people in whatever year, 85 or 6 or something, 85, 4 or 5, something like that. And uh, and we were very, we, now we'd worked our way up. We played a place called M80s, and later it was called the Party Place or whatever in Thornton, and we used to sell that place out. So we'd been there several times. But we sold out the rainbow, we're in the billboard charts, we're doing really well, and we drive three or four hours away to go to Albuquerque, I think it was, and there was maybe 100 people. There was no no MTV down there. We mm. weren't on the air. We were a novelty. Nobody but knew who you were. Yeah. We were in a few record stores and stuff. We had some ardent fans there, and it was like, wow. Then we, when we played in Puerto Rico, the only time in our career where we had a band that we thought was in a way bigger than us open for us, we had uh, a bunch of regional bands from there and then some bands from the southeast. And then Rick Derringer, or the, the producers, then Rick Derringer, then us, and then the headliner was Pat Travers. Hmm. So we were very popular in Puerto Rico, Denver, Portland, Spokane, we, you know, reasonably popular, of course, in our own corner of the world. Um, and then it was spotty in other parts, real popular in Texas, had some spots in Florida, never really made big inroads into California like you would have thought maybe we would have done. It was just really kind of a roller coaster. Yeah, the power of <laughs> the, the national and international media. Well, I, I oh, got yeah. It. Well, think of Puerto Rico. That always fascinated me. Now, we played there in 82. It was called Rincon Ochenta Dos, the first time we played there. And we weren't known. And we went and played on the far end of the island for some outdoor festival. And we had a great set, and they liked us. And so we had an underground following from that, and then MTV hit. So we had a kind of a perfect storm down there mm. of having already showed up. And it's not like they can get everybody down there, you know. And so they'd gotten a band that they liked and it sort of attached themselves to, and then we won this contest, and and we started getting airplay, and we're on, on TV, and we we really caught on down there. So you just never know. <laughs> yeah. Who would have thunk, you know, that we go from Seattle, Washington, to one of our biggest spots of success was Puerto Rico. Yeah, Puerto Rico, that's funny. You know? So the um, MTV basement tapes that you won, the, it, I understand it was your manager at the time submitted it without the video of Hello, without you guys even knowing about it initially, or? No, I think she, uh, uh, I can't remember the exact story, but I, I think she brought it up to us, but I maybe hadn't really explained what it was all about. Uh, sort of just went on a, with a step of faith, and we were sort of aware, but it was like way up on our radar screen, you know. I probably wouldn't have. Uh, now, we... I can't remember if we knew about it. See, I think it may not have gone that way. I think we knew we were going to enter the contest when we did the video. But I think that we weren't positive that it was going to be some really cool thing. Yeah. But when we did it, we had we had a, our own. We had 61,000 watt lights. Parlance. And we took all the gels out of them. So we played the night before at the uh, um, the Juanita Fieldhouse, which is one of the biggest gyms in, in the state in uh, Kirkland. And we had a show the night before, a big show. And we invited people to come back the following day for the filming of a video for MTV. So we must have known we were going to submit. Because I remember we said that. So I just don't remember the exact story, but I remember this part of it. So we uh, we. Uh, took all the gels out. We left everything set up, took all the gels out, and then we already recorded the song. We just played it through the monitors and mined to the, which is typical back in the 80s, you know. It's still typical, you know, that you're playing the song to your own already recorded song. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so we did that, and we had hundreds of people come back and spend the day with us, you know. And we had these two guys... And I'm sorry, I don't remember their names. Nice guys that were video 
just video uh, uh, addicted video guys that had storyboarded the whole thing and they went through the whole storyboard we played the song over and over again maybe 30 times a minute long song and, and they they compiled it together and then she submitted it we ended up winning out of the whole country the biggest battle of the bands to that date mm -hmm. you know it was uh, uh, my only regret was that we didn't count it as such with some money behind us to the national press local band wins the biggest battle of the bands in history because that's exactly what it was at that point there'd never been anything bigger and we won and that was a uh, was a pretty special thing and you know they got the record deal with emi and everything and they did another video with us and you could see where at that point where they can change you know it looks like we're going to pull this thing off you know <laughs> you know this is looking pretty pretty encouraging you know so uh, um emi only put out an e a four song ep for you guys as well as doing the video what what happened with and then they did they was, drop you guys all that was uh promised from the beginning that's all that was promised was that. Yeah, that was the, what you got if you won. I see. So there was a, more of a test to see what what you know what happened if they did something. I don't think it was a test. It was the win. It's what you won. Ah. And, they, and it was uh, they spent about eighty thousand on each, so it wasn't a small amount. But what we didn't realize at the time that's one hundred and sixty grand. Now most record deals are uh, you know back then were like. 6% or 90% or whatever, and you have to pay back the initial yeah. investment out of that. So you figure 6 out of 90 is like 5% of wholesale. How many records you get to sell to pay back 160 grand mm. at 5% of uh, like $4 or something, 20 cents, you know? It's a lot of records. So even though we did very well with them and got the billboard charts, we never got to where we were making money off of that record, which is typical, yeah. actually. So you guys eventually went back and did your third out, or your, I guess your second full-length album uh, on your own label again. Uh-huh. Yep, paid for ourselves. And then we did a, a, another uh, a fourth one the same way. So, and you left uh, the band initially for a couple of years uh, around the late 80s or so, early 90s, or? No, I left in uh, in uh, 86, and I'm not sure if I got back in 89 or 90, somewhere in there. So for like three years, something like that. I went and got a business degree from the University of Washington, and uh, ended up working, starting the, the music business program at the Art Institute of Seattle in Seattle and um, was living in Seattle and was pretty separate from those guys for just a few years there, you know, doing my own thing. And that's when they got uh, uh, three different guitarists, Joe Shikani, Jeff Northrup, and, uh, and Ronnie Montrose. Montrose, yeah, I even played with you guys. I remember that was pretty, I was like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I, I went saw him at the Paramount, and that was an interesting experience because you can imagine I half wanted him to succeed, and half wanted him to fall on their face. Like, <laughs> that is because I got rid of that Rick guy. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't necessarily be so good for me, but it'd be great for them. And uh, but uh, instead of being wrapped up in that kind of thinking, when I ended up out front, I found myself more interested in it. And oh, so that's how. Each one of the guys looked from way out front. Mm. Of course, I'd never seen them. Yeah. Uh, well, I found myself kind of just enjoying the show, and uh, Randy Hansen was there, and he came up and gave me a, a, a bear hug. He's just a sweetheart of a guy, and said, uh, almost like he knew, you know, this must be a little strange for you. <laughs> you know, and uh, I just hung out and watched him, and it was actually enjoyable. And I met Ronnie once, and it was short, and and, you know, I didn't get to know him or talk to him at all. Of course, they were with him in quite a few months. I don't know how long, but uh, and they have a couple unusual stories about that whole experience. You know, he's definitely a, kind of a strange, was a strange dude. Mm -hmm. A little bit on the dark side. So you, um, 
eventually you got back together with the guys, though, and started playing some gigs and stuff again. Well, I, yeah, the whole purpose of getting back is uh, to do the third record. I came back to do that. Because we had quite a bit of unfinished business. We had music we toured with that we never recorded. And so I said I'd do the record, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to play live. And then since I did the record, why not play live? And then, uh, and it was back, back to business, you know. And then right after that, not long after that, Kelly moved. And so then, in like around 93 or 4, we did some shows without Kelly. And then we did some shows where Kelly just joined us on the encore and stuff. Kind of weird. Mm. And then and then we, and that was with Mark Welling on drums. And it was played with Blood Good, among other people. And, and had always looked up to Kelly, like a, a, a younger version of Kelly, really. Mm. Kelly came back, and then was business as usual. So Kelly and I are the only two that ever stepped aside for a while, but, you know, um, it was so short that when I say we've been a band for 40 years, it seems appropriate, you know, especially since we all came back. Yeah. So you guys played Paul Allen's Experience Museum when that was... When that opened, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I played in two bands that night. I played in rail, and I played in a band called Scrap metal, and huh. scrap metal was Roger Fisher, uh, Steve Lawson, uh, Mike DeRocher, uh, and two of the guys from TKO, the guitarist, lead singer, uh, a guy or two from Metal Church, oh, wow. and, and, you know, it was just a, a bunch of Northwest guys, and we played, we played a bunch of Hendrix, which was, which was only appropriate, and we had like six string guitars up there. <laughs> Well, my idea, I said, let's uh, just kind of go around the group from left to right and each take like 16 bars or whatever so the sound they can kind of go, oh, I see what's going on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully everyone will be heard. I have no idea if any of us were heard, to be honest. It's a lot of people on stage. You know? Yeah. But it was fun to do. I imagine. All-Star Seattle band. <laughs> And, and what was fun is Roger and I were the only two that bothered out of six guitars to actually learn some of the Hendrix stuff. And one of the songs we do is all on the Watchtower. So Roger and I started the. You know, we did that in unison with just DeRocher because we all tried to start going. Da, 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 da. It was just a big freaking cluster because you had like 15 people all trying to play in unison and not really having found the beat yet in a way, you know. Mm. And so DeRocher stopped and goes, this isn't working. He goes, hey, you too. And I, and I ended up in a band with him with the other bastards. Years later, I have the highest respect for DeRocher, but I didn't know him very well then. He goes, since he knew that we were doing this all the beginning, you start, so it was just the three of us started going da 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 without bass or anything da 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 yeah, I've seen a few of those things live where, uh, like, Van Halen with Allison Chains coming out and then all of them doing rock and roll and two drummers and two lead guitarists and Lane Staley was on guitar and Sammy Hagar was on guitar and a bunch of people. <laughs> like, there's too many people on stage. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I've never been a big fan of that kind of stuff, really. I don't like jams, per se, either. Just the second year in noise because I have, like, yeah, I can still hear you. Well, I just had a couple more things I was going to ask you anyway, and then I'll let you go. Um, you guys have um, put out some CD versions of your of your uh, catalog as well. I, I picked up a couple of them from your <laughs> online site that, that Kelly sent me. Um, and put some of the earlier tracks uh, of the single that you guys did in the 70s and that sort of thing on there, too. Have, have you had good success with those? Are you happy with how those came out and everything? Or? Well, I mean, first off, we don't have the masters for... Uh, the and I have some masters. We don't know where they are, and we can't get them. Oh. And they're, they're not going to do a CD. 
and we don't have the masters of uh, of uh, the first record. I think they're destroyed. We have the masters for the the, the uh, third record, but we haven't gone back in and, and remastered them. So all of those were somebody transferring off of uh, a vinyl, I think. Oh, and wow. So the, the quality overall is just okay because you know you're not doing what you really should be doing to get it right. But we wanted, we thought it was more important to at least make the music available to people who would want it. That maybe you know, I mean, obviously, even if they had file, they might not even have a record player anymore. Maybe they'd never even heard it. You know. So we were willing to compromise the audio sound to get to be able to get it out there. And then we thought it'd just be fun to throw in some other, you know, unique a few live cuts and stuff just to make it interesting and, and some. Uh, you know, some added uh, uh, multimedia features. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing it that way or not, but we had it for a while. I think you can see some videos, also some radio interview clips and stuff. Uh, but it's more or less like, when you think about it, like a historic, historical for the record type of thing than anything else. It's, it's, it's a little different when you're, if you're not a major act and you don't have access to all your masters, it's harder to, to, um, turn out that sort of thing and uh, you know for example uh, the first record Michael Fisher had it for years and we don't even know what happened to it he doesn't know either <laughs> he really help us yeah he out of it he wouldn't care um, and the third record was at Triad and Triad went out of business the, the fourth record's not a problem because it's digital anyway and yeah we have yeah. it so uh, it's just you know something was just Probably kind of typical, a compromising of the of the original stuff, and, and a lot of people are running into it. Even major artists, where they have to bake the you probably heard about this bake the tapes and everything to try to get them not to be stuck together, and you know, uh, oh yeah, you're talking about stuff that's twenty, thirty, forty years old. Yeah, and celluloid celluloid tape um, degenerates just as movies do and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and so there's a real problem, I'm sure, in the number of when you hear about people remastering things, it's pretty cool that they even have something to remaster. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, especially from way, way back. So uh, I'm happy in that we have content, but I'm not thrilled with the audio quality because, you know, it's just what we had to work with, you know. You did a pretty good job. Oh, hold on just a sec, Rick. i got to just run outside real fast. My little daughter is here on the bus. And, uh, and it's a small community, and a lot of us know one another and have a lot of history, and a lot of us have played in different bands with one another. I mean, I've been in a band with Len Sorensen and DeRozier and Roger, and I'm in another band with Len Sorensen now with Spike and the Impalers. Len Sorensen's been in every band in the Northwest. <laughs> and then Len was in a band with uh, Joe Shikani, who played in rail, and and uh, Mark Welling was in our band, and he was in another band with me and uh, and uh, other guys from uh, Perennial. And it's just like everybody's played with everybody, and so there's a lot of history there that's shared. Yeah. Yeah, I've and talked to a few of the guys, uh, besides yourself, of course. Uh, uh, Michael Fisher has been really nice uh, working on some questions, both him and Roger. All right now, Scott Earl like played with everybody. <laughs> yep. uh, yeah, and Mark actually, I think I'm going to end up doing something with him, and you know, he played with some of the guys from Queens, right? Pre that. Uh, yeah, time period. And, and you probably know this, and I don't know how much you want to say about this because they don't like to hear it too much. I don't think, but I gave both Chris DeGarmo and Mike Wolf guitar lessons. Uh, <laughs> I, gave Chris, I gave Chris like two or three, and I'm not exaggerating. I didn't give him any. But I taught Mike for several months and taught him music, some music, basic music theory and modal playing and stuff. And of course, he went on the cornish and learned a bunch of stuff. So I, when it said, I don't like to become across like I'm, I'm thinking I, you know, I'm the reason that they did something. I yeah. Just, they did take lessons. But what's wild is they had a band called Joker, and Joker had the two of them, uh, and Paul Passarelli, who was another student of mine. 
and Doug McGrew, who's played with everybody. And then at the same time, uh, Jeff Teep was in a band called Helm's Deep, and his guitarist, Jeff Olson, who was another guitar student. Uh, <laughs> so there was a, that, the whole teaching thing at some point, if you'd like. I wouldn't mind sharing some of that, because I, I, I think I did a, some kind of a imprint on things with uh, teaching for years. And I taught for years. I taught hundreds of kids. And, uh, in fact, David Hillis, if you know who he is. Oh, yeah, Hill, yeah. He was a student of mine. Um a lot of people were students of mine, and, and I, I, I really poured myself into that. And I think that's a little bit a part of my legacy. The other thing I think is a part of Rail's legacy is whenever they talk about grunge, they talk about bands like the Heat, the Cowboys, and, and the punk side of it. But they never talk about the hard rock side of it. And luckily, yeah. the grandparents of punk were the hard rock bands and the punk bands. Because the hard rock bands were all corporate with their lyric structure, which was not what grunge was about. But they punk bands were whipped compared to the hard rockers, so it certainly wasn't the punk bands that gave way to grunge. Yeah. Grunge, grunge came out of the punk bands and the hard rock bands. And I, you know, I mean, we were playing all the dance halls down in the, in the, in Aberdeen and Oakland or whatever, all those places. So I would be willing to bet big money. I know that some of the guys at Soundgarden used to follow us, that these guys saw it and they saw the hard rock thing. And, then they saw the punk guys do, and somehow I think that I, you know, I'd be curious to see a, a musicologist get involved with the local scene and see what they thought was yeah. what happened. Or, well, I, uh, that's I that's my feeling as well, Rick. It's it's you know, I'm I'm not like a formal musicologist, but it's just something that I've, you know, growing up in the music scene for years, being a record collector and, and seeing many bands and being friends with bands. I'm, I'm from Portland, um, Oregon originally. So I was a little more immersed in that scene was seeing wild dogs and black and blue and a lot of the other bands down there. Um, but I did see stuff up in Seattle, and I also have a lot of friends that I met over the years that were, you know, early members of Queensryche fan clubs and things like that and followed you guys and followed, you know, TKO and Culprit and a lot of the other bands up there and knew, no, you know, still know guys from a lot of those bands, still friends with them. And, and that's the reason I wanted to do this book, because there's nobody, nobody's done it. I mean, there's... Yeah. There's a, a guy that's a historian up there in Seattle that did a book on the Seattle music scene a, a couple years back, and literally there's like a small little section on hard rock and metal, and of course a huge thing on grunge, and it was such a huge part in the 80s and the, and you know late 70s and especially on through the 80s. That was, you know, my formative years. You know, I discovered Queensryche because Bob Anchetta would play that kind of stuff on KGON, you know, yep. and, and Rail, you know, always a yep. champion yep, sure. for you guys. And KGON was very kind to us, and that was, that was very cool. Oh, I remember yeah. hearing Hello and, you know, all, a bunch of different songs of yours that or they would play on the radio and, and uh, uh, the... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, of course, no, nobody plays any of that kind of stuff anymore. But. You know, and, uh, but what I was thinking, too, when you were saying Portland, I mean, the, 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 the thing goes so far. Black and Blue opened for us, and I taught Tommy about was having a major problem keeping his left ball in tune. And uh, we had learned from Roger and his uh, people about using gun slick up in the nut to help the string keep the strings from, from sticking. And so I showed it to him during a break. And his guitar stayed in tune the whole night. The whole band was thanking us. I think they might have been called Movie Star then. I can't remember. Yeah, the yeah. That's one of their and, uh, names. And, you know, so I even approached Tommy to say, remember the gun slick in the nut recently? Because, you know, he's doing the whole kids thing. And I didn't even respond, which kind of hurt my feelings. I thought he was acting like I was a god for saving his ass, you know? Because <laughs> he was tuning, like, between every song. Because it was just getting stuck. But the first time I, I went back and I asked him how he was wrapping the strings and everything. And, so I would be more careful about wrapping the strings, but then I just put some gun slick, which is just a graphite lubricant. Oh, yeah. In, yeah. The, in the nut, and he stayed in tune, and he was thrilled. He's probably using something like that to this day. And it's just because of not me, it's because of Roger, whoever came up with it originally. Yeah. Passing it on. Yeah, it's funny. I, I actually went to the same high school as Jamie and, and Tommy and so, uh, a couple of the other, like one other of the guys in the band, I think, went there too. I, I met the three. What's that? They were a cool band. 
Yeah, no, I, I, when, they were a few years before me in, this, in the mid to late 70s sort of thing. But, oh, I don't know, about eight, nine, ten years later, something like that, they came back to my high school, were still friends with, with my art teacher and stuff there. And, and I remember, like, you know, we'd all heard about them and they'd played, you know, one or two of their songs or their first album on the radio by that point and stuff. And so that was, that was an early impression for me of somebody that made it out of, you know, a local situation. And, but, um, yeah, well, unfortunately I, I haven't know, had much luck in getting hold of it. When you were coming up with God, that was a fun club. Yeah, for we, what's we that? Played, uh, you know, of course we played the Copper Penny. Oh yeah. Played, yeah. Uh, um, what was the name of the church that was turned into a, you know, downtown, uh, had a balcony. Um, it was a pretty cool venue. So they had a f- uh, Starry Night and a few of those. Starry Night, yep. That's the one, yeah, yeah. That's, we, I didn't know that was a church. <laughs> that's where I met Richie Blackmore. Oh, nice. Yeah, and he just acted like, I told him, you know, you were a big influence, blah, blah. Kept it really short, but made him, made him a compliment. And he just more or less looked at me like, oh, well, are you done? Wow. Yeah, that's I've heard that a lot about some of the Deep Purple guys. Unfortunately, uh, George Lynch, the guitarist for Doc, and I met at a show many, many years back, and he wasn't feeling too odd, but he still came out and signed a bunch of autographs and things after the show. And, and I said, well, you're not feeling good. I'm sure people would understand. He goes, you know, I still do it anyway because, he said, when I was a kid, I idolized Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple, and I waited for like three hours to meet him after the show in, you know, L.A. or something like that. And he said, they just brushed me out of the way to get out of the way, kid, and took off. And, and he said, I, w- I vowed I'd never do that to anybody else ever if I was a star at some point or whatever. So I thought they're pretty telling. Well, you know, I don't know if you know about my, my guitar product, but I sell a sustainer I co-invented back in the late 80s with Floyd Rose. And I've been selling them for years. The Phil Collin model, uh, Jackson Guitars, he's been using my sustainer for like 20 years. I didn't years. know you were involved in that. I knew Floyd Rose invented the locking tremolo system, so interesting. Well, if you look on Kramer, uh, if you look at the Kramer site, uh, um, Classic Kramer or something, and just put, like, search Classic Kramer or something like Classic, I think it's Classic, and my name is Sustainer, you'll get the page that kind of tells the background how it started. I'm about to come out with a new one called Hard Driver that the guys at EMG developed with me. And so I've been selling Sustainers for years. And um, we just put the new Hard Driver in George Lynch's guitar and went out and met him and gave it to him. And he used it the whole night. And he couldn't have been a nicer guy. What a yeah, a really, really nice, nice guy, guy, definitely. And yeah, really Don Dawkin, not that so means, much. I, but. I didn't pay attention to Dawkin, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I, did, I mean, we opened for Dawkin at the Lamore, um, you know, years ago. And and uh, I didn't even meet him or anything. And I didn't care about the band. Again, it was sort of a contemporary, so I didn't care so much. And I just didn't give him the time of day and it was because I didn't meet the cool guys. Just I wasn't interested, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, um, yeah, you were guy kind of ahead of those guys, I think, at that point. <laughs> well, I was doing my own thing, you know. And so anyway, but but he was just, he couldn't have been any nicer when we went out and met him and, and brought the, uh, you know, a buddy of mine and I brought the, uh, the new sustainer we installed in one of his guitars up here. And he ended up, he said, well, you know, he tried it sound check, thought it was cool. Said, I can't guarantee anything. And we left, came back. And he used it for the whole set, the whole set. It was really cool. <laughs> we were pretty, pretty excited about that. Sounds like it worked pretty well. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. That's a whole other thing. I mean, there is also, you could argue a, um, like a, trend in the Northwest for innovation as well, like Floyd, who also played Q5. And, yeah. And then most people don't know about my whole thing. I, I haven't, you know, really pushed it, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm the one that actually thought of it and brought it to Floyd, and we came out with it before Sustainiac, and then they copied us and, in fact, stepped on some of our patents and had to do a licensing with us. 
So I pretty much started that whole revolution, believe it or not, I haven't made much money for it yet. I'm obstinate. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I didn't know that, that you were involved in that as well. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's something that I actually first thought of it way back in 1980. And there was a sustainer out there, and it was by uh, Roland, and it was on their synthesizer guitar. And I thought it was so cool. I wanted one. I couldn't understand why they didn't come out with another. Well, they did it a different way where they actually grounded every single fret and ran the charged strings through a magnet, and that caused a field. And you could see where that would never be practical. Can you imagine how difficult it is to yeah. ground every single fret? Yeah, wouldn't work. To close the circuit. So I, I went about it in a very different way. I, I blew, actually blew up a pickup and almost killed myself trying to, because they didn't know enough about electronics, but I just hooked a power amp up to a pickup and just tried to drive the string. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked for a few seconds before it fried the pickup. And then I got with a guy named Steve Moore, who uh, was a guitar player and also a circuit designer. And he's been my partner ever since, and he's the one that designed the circuit that we ended up, that we still sell. And we ended up getting five patents and all sorts of stuff. And sold to Kramer until Kramer went bankrupt and had a deal with Fender, and that never really turned into anything. And then finally went, went uh, solo. Ended up in selling to Jackson. But hey, I'm at my next appointment. I gotta go. That's that's okay. I, I appreciate your time, Rick. It was a lot of fun talking to you and I'll keep you in the loop on this. Uh I've already got a, a number of interviews in the can and a bunch of people working on them. I, my my intention was to pitch it to publishers after I had kind of enough of the the bones of it together. Um sure. But uh, I'll definitely keep you in the loop. I'll make sure, of course, you get copies. And uh, and also, just think about if you need anything else that you think might help. I'm, I'm up for it. So. I might bug you about contact info for somebody as well as I'm sure I'll probably think of some follow-up stuff. So I'll definitely... We can do some of it even via messaging or whatever, too. Sounds good. Bye, man. All right. Great talking to you, Rick. Take care. Yeah, yeah you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.